Good morning, everyone. Come on, this is a call and response. Good morning, everyone. I'm sure you've had the honor of being a part of some lively discussions over the last few days. Hopefully, our panel would be able to provide some new insight. So I would like to first welcome you to the high-level panel, Innovation for Sustainable Development, Leaving No One and No Place Behind. I am extremely honored to be joined by a very distinguished panel. And for those who do not know, my name is Jamira Burley, and I work as the head of youth engagement and skills at the Global Business Coalition for Education. Like this panel, I believe in bringing unlikely suspects and individuals from a wide range of industries together to think innovatively about how we can not only move our communities, but our um, community members forward in providing solutions that can help to advance the impact needed for real sustainable change change. Today we will be discussing um, territory innovation policies and I think it's really important that um, we recognize that sessions like these as well as conferences like these unfortunately are only able to allow a limited amount of people to participate and so we have to ensure that those who are not here today um, can not only be a part of the conversation but also can hear some of the solutions my colleagues on the stage would put forth. So I ask that you tweet out using the hashtag EDD19 as well as the hashtag think twice. Again that's the hashtag think twice and hashtag EDD19. Um, 19. So with that being said, we're going to jump right in, right? Because today we will explore territory intervention and policies that contribute to the achievement and sustainable development goals. This is really an opportunity for us to create a world that, again, leaves no one and no place behind. We know that the world is experiencing unprecedented economic growth, and the benefits of development is reaching communities far and wide. But we also know that the inequalities within territories have continued to rise. For instance, in world cities, and um, citizens experience um, access inequalities, they also have limited access to opportunities, income gap, and social exclusion. Unfortunately, even within cities, the daily lives of individuals are also um, grappling with inequalities with the extreme uneven living in different neighborhoods. It's also important to recognize that the disparity in provisions of services, economic growth, and access to resources among regions and cities in the same country um, also leave a lot of, to be desired and also recognize the need to localize and regionalize the solutions needed for change. This process has been echoed not only in this conference, but in other global community debates, as well as in other forms. Because the role of cities and local communities um, in giving concrete impulse to the achievement of the sustainable um, development goals cannot be overlooked. Innovation in the broader sense can be an enabler, right? It can also help us to achieve concrete solutions that will result in territory equalities. This does not necessarily or does not only include technology, right? It also means looking at other methods of practice as well as other solutions for change. For instance, new governance to the adoption of the ICT um, applications from the integration of the of frugal innovation within communities, or even the upgrading of skills. All of these things are also important. Um, it really recognized the need that we combine the leave no one behind as well as leave no place behind ideas um, to find relevant solutions for on the ground action. Now this debate will explore new perspectives taken from the international organizations, city networks, local authorities, investment banks, and scientific in the scientific community to really think about how do we analyze and tackle such a global um, these global aspirations for change and really localize it for the communities on the ground who are every day experiencing um, some of the biggest atrocities of our society. 
So with that being said, I get the honor of introducing this amazing distinguished panel who will hope to not only frame the discussion, but also provide you some concrete examples of what's actually happening already in communities across the world. Um, now, a little, unfortunately, we have one guest that is running a little bit late. Um, we have the Deputy Director General for the Joint Research Center who's going to join us a little bit later. But I want to introduce our current panel who is on the stage. And I should apologize ahead of time for my American accent and vocabulary if I mispronounce anyone's name wrong. Um, don't hold it against me. But our first guest up is Ms. Claudiette um, Irere, um, the Permanent Secretary Minister of Information and, Communi and Communications Technology. Innovation for Rwanda. Before joining the minister, the minister um, Ms. Claudiette co-founded a startup, the first um, fibrabic, fib, fib, Fab Lab Rwanda, an extension wing of the Knowledge Lab, K Lab, while diligently working for Rwanda Online Platform, a private-public partnership startup to digitize um, government, serv government services and citizens and businesses across Rwanda. So thank you for joining us. Can we please give her a round of applause? We also have Dr. Ben Norji, who is the regional director for the European Union countries for the World Bank Group. At the World Bank, he has worked with both country operations and research in Eastern Europe, Central Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Prior to joining the World Bank, he taught for the Center for Development Economics at the Williams College in Massachusetts, USA. Please give him a round of applause. And you know, we can't have this conversation without ensuring that we include the voice of one of the largest populations this world has ever seen, young people. They are leading the charge in almost every area and issue we see around the world. And so I'm super excited to welcome our guest, Ms. Latrice Pinheiro, um, who is an MA, who has an MA of Urban Planning, Sustainable Development, and Territorial Systems, and has a BA in Civic Engineering. She's also currently the Labor Pathway Fellow for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, Solutions Network Youth Projects, and she's also because young people can, you know, have to do it all. She is also working with the Voices of Belo Horoso um, Women, who is a collective building public spaces for safety and inclusion for all. So please join me in welcoming her to the stage. So I want to start the conversation um, with the permanent minister of Rwanda, and I want to ask her as we see so much innovation in happening around the world, and your experience in working with one of Rwanda's, um, working in Rwanda, what have been some of the technology, the technical advances and governance um, tools for social and environmental change that you've seen directly in your work? Um, thank you very much for having me. And um, yes, you did a good job in, uh, you know, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's Claudette Irere, and I'm the permanent secretary at the Ministry of um, ICT and Innovation in Rwanda. And um, yes, um, to answer to your question, uh, some of the things uh, that, uh, some of the advances, what you would refer to advances uh, in, uh, in, in, in Rwanda, I think they stem from, uh, you, you know, a vision a vision to turn the country into a knowledge-based economy. Mm -hmm. uh, to just give you a little bit of a perspective, uh, we are, uh, I think, a country of uh, around 12 million citizens. Uh -huh. We're very small, we're landlocked. And uh, the biggest uh, uh, you know, uh, percentage of the population is very young, 65% is young. And so, um, and, uh, being uh, in that position, in that particular position, makes you want to think, um, you know, how, how are you going to ensure that you have jobs for these young people mm -hmm. that, um, you know, uh, your citizens, the 12 million citizens have, um, you know, the well-being is well taken care of and, and catered for. And so investing in technology was one of the things that uh, uh, the government decided to do. And uh, to many, it didn't seem like quite obvious, but uh, you know, looking back, it was actually one of the, 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 the turning point. 
Um, today, you would talk about some of the, today all the citizens, um, you know, have access to government services. Mm -hmm. When you have, uh, when you get your citizens to request for services, then um, you are ensuring accountability, that's one. <coughs> uh, you're making sure that the taxpayer money is not wasted, but it's actually accounted for. And uh, when you, as a government, take the lead in putting you know, um, some of these services online, you're giving a leeway to some of the creative minds to actually think on top of what is already there, what else can be added. And we've seen this. Um, you know, when you've put your, your, for instance, your national identification you know, in one uh, system, then anyone, if you want to create um, a solution in the health sector, then you can add on top of that. And we've seen this happening. And if you want to do anything around transport, then you can add on top of that. Because you've created this platform that anyone can actually plug into. And it helps because now the creatives are looking around in a contextual um, manner, looking at the challenges that need to be uh, given um, priority, and they're the ones that are coming up with solutions. You know, instead of what is, you know, solutions coming from elsewhere to come and be plugged into the country, but now you can see that they are sprouting uh, from the country. And what, what, another thing that you also, uh, when you give priority to technology and, to, and you, you, you take the lead in ensuring that this happens, what you're also ensuring is inclusivity, you know, and uh, I think it addresses, it goes back to leaving no one behind. And so you are giving uh, an opportunity for women, for youth, for people with disabilities to actually start thinking in their own context, what is it that we can, uh, we can now um, take out of here, or we can add on top of this. And we've seen this. Um, I've, been, I've had the pleasure of leading one of the innovation hubs in Kigali, and uh, um, you know, this, this innovation hub is um, partially supported by the government. Uh, the government ensures that uh, the, 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 there's connectivity, there's space, that the young people and anyone really can actually come in here in this space. And, uh, you know, with a bit of structure, then you start seeing these young people coming in and, 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 and getting together, creating small companies. And today, some of the companies that we have in the country came from, uh, from, from, from that space. And here, when I say it's not only the ones that are able, it's everyone. Yeah. It's the women, it's the youth, it's the people with disabilities, it's everyone that comes in, in this space. Uh, what we are currently doing is looking at how to disseminate some of these innovation hubs and putting them around uh, the country in other uh, places to make sure that even um, people in other remote areas have access to these tools and, um, you know, see what kind of talent and innovations can come uh, from there. So what do we do? Uh, I think as a government and as, uh, you know, the development partners and anyone really interested in the development is, um, is to ensure that you create a conducive environment, is to ensure that you avail these types of, of spaces is to ensure that you invest um, in uh, connectivity, ensure that everyone has access to affordable, um, you know, smart devices and, uh, and, and, and the prices are not hiked. Uh, and uh, make sure that the policies and the regulations are also, um, you know, in favor of this. And uh, if you want to also make your, 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 this whole innovation ecosystem a bit dynamic, bring in, uh, make sure that you, you, you put in place incentives that uh, bring in even um, foreign mm -hmm. uh, players in the ecosystem. So it's not just localizing these global goals, it's actually allowing for the local ideation of it, so having people in the community develop the solutions that help to feed into the global goals. 
Yes, definitely. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, people speak to their own challenges. Mm -hmm. So allowing other people, I think the space for, yes, um, collaboration. But if you give a voice to the, to, to the locals, you're actually assured that you're going to tackle the exact challenges that they're facing. But if you let other people come and start innovate around you, then chances are they will not speak the same language, they will not translate what you're really trying to, to come up with into um, real uh, solutions. Awesome. Can you share with us um, any practical examples that you've seen either as the minister uh, or in your work prior to joining um, that really ca characterize why it's been successful based on what you've outlined thus far? Um, I, I, and I think, you know, being at EDD and being on different panels, I, I feel like I'm going to start repeating myself. <laughs> But yesterday, I talked about um, one of the government platforms, for instance. Um, in, in, um, so just to give an overview, um, the, the government of Rwanda put out a plan um, of uh, and becoming a knowledge-based economy. And in the first, um, it, it was a phased approach. And the first phase ensured that you have institutions that are going to carry this vision and make sure that this happens. So you have a regulator, you have implementing agencies, you have ministries. You make sure that your regulations and policies are actually going to be in favor of whatever it is that you're coming up with. Now, the second phase uh, looked at investment, hardcore investment, making sure that, you know, connectivity, uh, data storage and exchanges and all these things are in place. Now, the third phase is leveraging these uh, first two things and making sure that you have services. Mm -hmm. Now, when we go to this service part, um, this is where you could see this was actually what they call a tipping point, right? Um, the government itself put uh, a platform, uh, a government platform where you uh, citizens get these services from. And when this was done, and remember, I think it was, you know, towards the end of uh, 2015, you could see, you know, it was becoming hard. People were used to their ways of, um, you know, um, manual services and, and, and everything that goes with that. And so it was almost like you're pushing the citizens out of their comfort zone. Yeah. Um, but now, four years down the road, three and a half years down the road, uh, this platform, because of it being in place, it has created more than 40,000 jobs wow. in the community. So this means that um, everyone now sees the value. Um, another thing, and these are things that anyone can actually uh, look into, is this accountability part that I talked about. You are actually saving a lot by putting all these things, um, you know, going digital. Another thing that it has done, to date, and I think two days ago, that's when they celebrated the, 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 the milestone, they've served up to 7.5 million um, people. So this means that everyone has gone to this platform, has either been able to get whatever it is that they were looking for without wasting time, and there's resources that go into that and everything else. And here I'm not going to talk about the ripple effect, you know, the ripple effect being in seeing an increase in, uh, in um, uh, 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 device ownership. Mm. And I talked about this yesterday. Because of this increase in device ownership and everyone now knowing how to use these devices, um, the government has had to now, um, you know, attract um, an investor that is setting up a factory um, you know, a manufacturing and assembly plant for smart smartphones mm -hmm. in Kigali, you know, and these are going to be sold, obviously, because it's being done in the country, they're going to be sold at a very relatively affordable price, and there's an opportunity for even exports. And when this factory is in the country, it is going to employ uh, people. So. Um, this was just an example of showing you that how one um, initiative 
led by the government because I think um, in our leadership has to lead the way. Uh, it has created all these uh, multiple facets around um, uh, you know, digitalization and everyone benefits at the end of the day. Yeah, so yeah. allowing government to set the stage but let the people run and create the solutions on their own. Awesome, thank you for that. We'll be coming back to you a little bit later. Um, but now I want to turn to Dr. Ben Nergi, who is the regional director for the European Union countries for the World Bank. Now, the World Bank has a mandate to end poverty, which is no small goal, um, and to promote shared prosperity. What are the emerging trends that you have identified in reaching this goal, and what are the specific local conditions and resources that put value and enable for potential territorial, regional, and our city solutions? I know that's a mouthful, <laughs> so I'll give you a chance to think about it, and yeah. Thank you, uh, Jamira, and, and, and it's a great pleasure to be part of this really distinguished panel. Addressing really, really core and critical issues of development. So I want to talk a bit about the spatial inequalities, right? So inequalities, certainly what we've talked about are inequalities between the rich and the poor. But uh, Jamira, as you talked about in your introduction, part of the inequalities that we see is also disputed unequally across space. Mm -hmm. As the World Bank works on its mission of ending poverty um, and essentially reducing inequality, that's what promoting shared prosperity uh, sort of means. Um, it really has focused much more in recent times on looking at what makes it that there are certain parts of each country, each region that grow, that thrive, and other parts that don't. Think about across the world. I mean, the big success story of our times in development is China. But what you know of as China on average is an average between the thriving southeastern coastal part of China and still the very, very um, lagging regions in central and western China. In my own country, India, um, New Delhi is now um, approaching in per capita income uh, a level that far outstrips many countries, certainly in South, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, while there are still people in a 500 kilometers away uh, from New Delhi who don't have uh, a square meal to eat. Here in Europe, and many of you are here in Europe, you have the same phenomenon happening. And part of what I will reflect on uh, during these next minutes is actually work we've done in Europe, which has uh, implications for the rest of the world. Is there anyone here from Romania? No? Anyone here who's been to Romania? All right. From where? We now, we to... So we have three or four people. So if you've been to Bucharest, just to let you know that Bucharest right now in per capita income is converging that, to that of Ile de France, Paris. Okay? So Romania, the poorest country in the European Union, has a capital whose per capita income is almost equivalent to Paris. And if those of you who've been to Romania has driven a hundred kilometers out of, Roman out of Bucharest, you see again their communities where children don't have clothes or shoes, where families don't have uh, indoor plumbing, um, where there is a level of deprivation that is at levels of South Asia. Mm. So what is going on? In Europe and across the world, and I would argue that it is true for Brazil, it is true in many ways also of countries such as Rwanda, you have parts of the country and parts of the population who are now thriving. They're as good as any in the world. And Madam Permanent Secretary, you were talking about some of them, right? These Rwandans who you were talking about can be as good and are as good as any of the technological leaders in the world. And yet, in the same country, in a slightly different geography, there are people who are struggling every day. Some recent work we've done in Europe, looking at what is happening in the territories and regions of Europe, point to one primary driver that is increasing in importance um, in these growing divides, as we call them. Mm -hmm. The growing divides, a primary driver is actually 
the flip side of what Madam Permanent Secretary talked about, technology. Technology is creating a very, very different classes of opportunities for one group of people for whom technology is a complement. And by the way, you know who this group of people are? People like us. For us, this thing is a complement to the work that we do. It really is making us more productive, sometimes, of course, destroying our life, uh, work-life balance and other things. Uh, but it is what is helping us become more productive, more integrated to the world, uh, able to be innovate, exactly the story that Madam Permanent Secretary was talking about. To many others, what technology is doing is actually making them less and less able to catch up with people like us and our compatriots. Mm -hmm. These are the growing divides that you see, and these are the growing divides among people and among regions all across the world. Um, there is a very important thing to think about then on how then to reduce inequality, which of course is the theme of the EDDs. It is about how to make sure that everyone, whether it be regions, whether it be peoples, whether it be firms, are able to be in that first group where technology is, is the source of prosperity and growth and not technology being the factor that widens the disparities between others. And therefore, again, the stories that we heard about Rwanda, the stories I know that we will hear from the work that Leticia and others are doing, it's very, very critical that we understand how we can make people access the technology. So let me give you a few other uh, snapshots, again from Europe, and I'm using Europe not just because I work on Europe, but because for the work that we do across the world, it is important to understand that the same phenomenon that is going on in Europe is also happening in other places and vice versa, that the stories about how to address the situation in Europe is really relevant for every other country that all of you work in. In Europe, the recent PISA studies, you know about PISA, which is the educational attainment studies that was done by the OECD? The 2015, which is the last round of data available, showed that in a country, on average, in the European Union countries, um, if you look at mathematics competency, now what does competency mean? It doesn't mean that you can't add or subtract. It means are you, if you're given a problem, can you solve it? Right? If I give you a mathematical problem, can you solve it? Can you use math in everyday life? So for 15-year-olds in Europe, on average, about 15% of 15-year-olds are actually not functional in mathematics. Now, this is far better than in any one of the countries most of you work on, right? So this is, a, if you'd like, a good score. However, in Bulgaria, the equivalent number is 42%. 42% of Bulgarians are not func Bulgarian 15-year-olds are not functional in mathematics. So think about what that means for being able to avail of the huge benefits of technology. If you're not able to solve basic math problems, can you really use technology to attain the levels of prosperity, the label, levels of integration that are required? Can you actually then catch up? So the inequities Again, within the European continent, between the countries such as the Netherlands, where the number is just 13%, and Bulgaria, where the number is 42%, are mirror images of what's going on. In Italy, by the way, Veneto in Italy has levels of attainment in mathematics comparable to Finland, which is among the best in the world. In the Mezzogiorno in southern Italy, and the Italians in this audience I know, um, the level is close to that of Bul Bulgaria. So within each country, you have the whole range in Europe also present within a single country. Last set 
of education, since education, Jamira, is where you work. Um, so then I said Netherlands is a great example, right? In the Netherlands, the average is 13% who are not proficient. If you look at the bottom 20%, the bottom fifth of the population in the Netherlands, that number is close to 50%. So the poorest people in the Netherlands actually have a level of math proficiency worse than the average in Bulgaria. Now, why am I talking about these inequalities in education? It is because these inequalities, which are both across space and across the levels of income, are the ones that then make you prepared to adapt to and adopt the driver technology that can, has the potential, the great potential, to narrow down the gaps between the rich and the poor, those who are able and those who are not, and especially for the young people. So what does our research across the world show? What can be done about this? One of the most important things to do about it is certainly, and that every country, every government, every uh, organization that partners in development is thinking about is how to make sure that these technological gaps are closed. But I would argue that just focusing on technology is insufficient. So there are three things in addition that you have to think about in order to make sure that these gaps are reduced. First, for the people. For the people, we have to pay attention to skills. And skills not in a very vague sense as it's used. Skills have become a sort of buzzword today. What does skills mean? Skills mean skills for the 21st century, which is not technical skills in order to be, know how to be a carpenter or how to be a mechanic or how to be a computer programmer. It is the fact that the world is changing so fast that jobs are changing as fast. So let me ask a quick quiz among all of us. I want a show of hands among this audience. How many of you are today doing exactly the job that you were trained for with your university degree? <laughs> Wow. Right. <laughs> By the way, congratulations uh, that you are doing the same job. Most of us are not. You certainly were not trained to become the permanent secretary of Rwanda, no. right? Um, and what does that mean? It means we, the privileged ones, have learned how to learn. Mm -hmm. We have learned how to adapt. We have curiosity, problem solving, critical thinking. These are the skills that are needed for the 21st century. And our educational systems have to move to teaching those rather than rote learning and rather than knowledge for knowledge's sake. It is about learning how to learn. Second, very quickly, for firms. What do firms need to do? Firms who are in the lagging regions or firms that are at the bottom, small firms especially. The development solutions are often and usually focus on money. Mm -hmm. They say, all right, they are capital constraints, so let's give some grants, uh, let's give some money to poor firms and small firms, and they will succeed, because that, by the way, if you ask firms often, they actually say, oh, it's just capital, that give me some money and we'll be great. Research finds that that's actually not what hinders small firms across the world. What hinders small firms are networks. It is networks, it's connections, it is peer-to-peer -peer learning, it is about the flow of knowledge, and that is much more important in today's world, to become, whether or not you're a small firm in some remote corner of Romania or a remote corner of an African country. What they need is a connection to the bigger world, and technology can actually um, help that. Last, what do governments need to do? And governments need to do a lot of things. They need to do everything. But one thing that is often forgotten is the policy framework that has to be a 21st century policy framework. And that means an adaptable policy framework. Often, governments, and we work at the World Bank very closely with governments, um, often governments 
um, are solving the problems of the 20th century because there's such, so much catching up to do. But today, what we have to do is to have policies and institutions that adapt very quickly to the challenges of the world that are there today. So let me conclude my initial remarks and just talking about the fact that technology really is, as is the theme of this conversation, today, perhaps the biggest way to address inequalities. However, access to technology, the use of technology to be essentially the ones who use ro uh, robots and technology, so to speak, as complements to make our lives more productive, more better, more fulfilled, is the aim, and that requires a set of policies, institutions, and focus areas on access to technology that is terribly important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, I want to pause there for a second and invite another of our panelists who have arrived to the stage. Um, please join me in welcoming Ms. Christelle um, Alverna, who is the Regional Coordinator for the West and Central Africa, the United Nations Capital Development Fund, to the stage. Thank you. Um, it's interesting that you mention skills, right? Because what I, one of the biggest facts that I've learned over the last few months is the fact that 17-year-olds today will have set 15 different jobs mm -hmm. in five different industries within their lifetime. But unfortunately, current data trends actually shows that out of the 1.8 billion young people the world has, 825 million of them are not on track to have those skills. So the need for constant relearning to have those transferable skills are much more evident now than previous in generations. Um, my last que question for you for this generation iteration is to ask, so how do we boost those solutions that you mentioned, right? What are the ways in which we can um, sustain the social change that is happening so far? So I'll move out of Europe and into um, the developing world using more my uh, work in my previous iteration when I was the World Bank's global head for social protection. Um, and I'll talk about just one thing that is terribly important for the poorest countries of the world and the poorest people, and that is identity. Across the world, the one thing that most people who are who don't, are not connected, who are excluded from the mainstream don't have, is an identity, a digital identity that actually connects them to the, to the state, to the rest of the population. Uh, I have uh, found an initiative that some of you may have encountered called Identity for Development, or ID4D. And what that is doing, uh, especially beginning with West Africa, but also in other parts of the world, is making sure that every citizen mm -hmm. in poor countries has a digital identity that connects them to social services and that essentially makes a connection between them and the state. This is especially true, by the way, of women, because women have, in, across the world, the biggest problem with having the state recognize them as individuals who are citizens with the rights and responsibilities that citizens have. For the government, having a digital identity that connects the various services, as you were saying, Madam uh, Permanent Secretary, is a tremendous help because then you know that if there is a set of data that says this person is poor, and then another set of data that says these are the services that this person is entitled to, often, and in fact, usually in most countries, these two databases don't talk to each other. And therefore, there, is, there are lots of people who fall through the cracks. So in accessing technology, one of the most important things are making sure that each citizen of a country has this direct, personal, and inviolate relationship with the state. I'll end with actually what the one thing that moves me a lot and comes from Leticia's country. Um, I worked in Brazil um, on a program, uh, the Brazilians have a famous program called Bolsa Familia. And if you Google Bolsa Familia and Google images, you'll come across some iconic pictures. And the iconic pictures are typically 
older women, often uh, Aboriginal women, who are holding up a card, a yellow card, that says that they are entitled to transfers, little, tiny little transfers from the state. And there's a smile on these people's faces that will melt your heart. Because for the first time, they see that they are members of the state, that they have rights, mm. that they actually can belong to the society uh, that they live in. Thank you for that. Wow. I'm going to look that up right after this session, so I really appreciate you mentioning it. And I also appreciate you mentioning the fact that you're right. Systems do not share information about individuals. We learned in Philadelphia, we know more about a child after their death than during their lifetime because you have different social, social services that aren't sharing information unless there is a tragic incident or a crime that occurs. So um, something to think about is as we are thinking about um, transparency and accountability is how our systems within our government sharing information so that way um, solutions can be based on the whole picture of an individual and not different aspects of their identity. So thank you for that. You. I would like to turn now to our most recent panelists and um, thank you for joining us. And my first question is based on your current position as the regional coordinator for West and Central Africa. Um, in your experience, what is the main challenges that you have experienced in less developed countries and in Africa countries in, sp in particular that are facing this, um, this, this problem of territory inequalities? Okay. Thank you very much. And first, let me apologize. I mean, Star will not align this morning with the train coming from Paris and then the traffic in, uh, in Brussels. So uh, apologize for that. But thank you for inviting uh, us uh, at, this, uh, at this panel. Um, if you allow me, I'm, I'm going to speak in French. Yes. Is that okay? Okay, thank you. So, uh, merci, merci beaucoup pour, uh, pour cette question. Firstly, thank you very much indeed for having asked me this question. In answering it, could I start by uh, fleshing out a number of contextual elements, uh, focusing on Western Africa in particular, but uh, Africa in general, and in particular, three key trends which will have a major influence and impact today on how these countries develop. The first tendency is that of demographic growth. Now, uh, demography is at the tip of everyone's uh, tongues, but you have to bear in mind that population growth doubled over the last uh, 20 years and is going to continue to double. We've got 500 million. We're going to have 1 billion inhabitants in 20 years' time. This is a very dramatic development. We've never seen that occur elsewhere. And uh, this is a trend uh, which uh, creates towns and conurbations uh, which are mushrooming everywhere all over Africa. We see rural areas being transformed into urban areas. And one particular feature of this demographic growth is that it is not accompanied by sufficient uh, growth in wealth uh, or growth in the economy. We have a 40 percent urbanization rate. Uh, uh, we've got uh, uh, 3,600 is the average GDP, uh, 1,800 uh, in certain parts of Africa, but in sub-Saharan Africa, mostly the per capita income is more like $1,000. Uh, so that's uh, one uh, telling factor. And then uh, that uh, leads me on to my second element, and that is uh, that uh, towns, cities, and conurbations are stretching out. Uh, and we estimate that over the next 15 years, uh, we will have uh, the equivalent of nine times uh, the area of France, which will be occupied by uh, urban areas, so less f potential farmland more people uh, moving into the cities, more pollution, and less by way of access to basic services. And then the third key factor is uh, economic growth, because uh, in a number of countries, there is a fairly sound economic growth. Uh, let me give you one example of Guinea, 10 percent economic growth over the last three years. And at the same time, this economic growth uh, has uh, been accompanied by a destruction of the uh, territory because it's linked to the mining of bauxite. And bauxite mining means that you take the first layer of the ground uh, um, removed, uh, which uh, then uh, ensures potential for mining. So 
how can we ensure that such growth can be transformed into opportunity? It's a challenge. In order to meet this challenge, I think that there is one key thing which we have to do, and that is to ensure access to both public and private finance for strategic actors. So who are these strategic actors? They are threefold. Firstly, local administrations, municipalities. I spoke about demographic growth, but we do not have a sufficient institutional structure in place to ensure that we can cope with it, and that is a fundamental challenge. Last Monday, we launched the local finance observatory with the OECD, and one of the results of this World Observatory for Financing is that local authorities represent 60% of infrastructure spending in OECD countries, but in Africa, it's only 10% or less. So one of the main problems that these towns are facing is a lack of financing to provide services. In order to do this, we need to create systems which can be transparent which can ensure that we know how resources are being allocated. So this is the first thing. We need to ensure access to public and private financing. The second key factor uh, is uh, trying to boost economic development. We know that SMEs, and in particular, the missing link uh, between $500 and $10 million when you have a, the small, medium-sized, and even micro-businesses, they do not have access to financing. Any financing is risky. They do not have access to their own resources, which will permit them to launch projects. So what we are trying to do is work with banks, bankable projects, to ensure that they can receive financing, which will drive the local economy, and this will have a positive impact. The third aspect is a trying to uh, finance uh, the uh, social uh, uh, fabric. You mentioned uh, digital, uh, the digital divide, digital funding. And this is one way in which we can ensure that the most vulnerable people in the population, women, young people, can have access uh, to uh, services uh, via digital financing. They can also be given uh, access to energy, uh, social transfers. And this is also one way in which we can ensure social and financial inclusion. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you for giving that overview. I'm sure it's of interest for a lot of people who are trying to, to better understand what's happening. And I guess as a follow-up for that, what are the opportunities that can come from governance tools and solutions that have already been developed to help um, provide concrete solutions? Well, thank you for the question. I think it's true that this is a very uh, important question for us because our role and our way of investing is that we try to test, we try to innovate, to come up with new solutions. What we have endeavored to do is to have a test bed. We have had some successes and failures in the three areas, which I think are particularly interesting when it comes to territorial inequality. The firstly is how do we set up systems to strengthen national financing systems via performance assessment and monitoring to ensure that states can ensure that their transfers of finance are both sustainable and credible and which will enable local authorities, uh, municipalities, uh, to have access to financing, both from the state, of course, but also to enable them uh, to uh, uh, get away from uh, the fiscal decentralization. Very often, the state claims that local governments uh, do not uh, have uh, enough by way uh, of uh, capacity to deal with financing, and then uh, the local authorities say they don't have enough money. So what we're trying to do is to get beyond this uh, and move towards international sources of funding, uh, for example, the green financing, which uh, can uh, ensure that uh, we can use uh, climate financing, which can then be transferred via local uh, population 
populations, local municipalities to plow it into local populations. I think that Rwanda, for example, has a very interesting approach in this respect, contracts between both the central state and uh, local governments. Uh, then the second point brings me back uh, to uh, what I said on the economic uh, structure. We have, as I have been said, been working with a number of uh, national domestic banks to try to convince them uh, to uh, plow money into SMEs and to find the best and the most appropriate tools. So we have one example from Guinea where we have been working together with the mining sector, with mines and uh, the uh, local banks uh, to ensure that we can set up uh, the necessary uh, guarantee mechanisms to ensure that uh, the uh, subcontracting uh, uh, firms linked to the mining industry, which could uh, create uh, jobs for either local population or migrants into the area, can uh, further uh, develop and make a profit. And this, therefore, means that mining, quite apart from uh, mining in the strictest uh, sense of the term, will be able to uh, create more economic activity which will be lasting. And then a third example would be the launching of a coalition which we launched in Malaga in October 2018. We worked together with the uh, Council of United Local Governments to set up a fund which will enable local communities to have access to international finance. This will enable them to receive technical assistance and guidance. This will enable them in turn to structure both their organizational uh, mechanisms and their financing to enable them to uh, go and request uh, resources from elsewhere. In rounding off, let me just say that uh, we do, of course, bear in mind that uh, uh, digitization has a key importance. It doesn't uh, give us an answer to everything, but if it is properly used to try to facilitate transfers of funding and social structures, uh, particularly this is a very useful tool and solution, particularly for young people and women. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I would like to now take this moment to invite our final panelist to the stage, Ms. Vichova, who's the Deputy Director General for the Joint Research Center to the stage. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Awesome. So I'm going to give you a second to, are you settled? Fine. Okay, awesome. Yeah. I'm going to ask you the hard questions, of course. <laughs> um, so when it comes to addressing territorial inequalities, the EC is, of course, one of the main actors for, um, on the European scene, um, but also outside of Europe. What is the main area to focus on for the institution like the Joint Research Center and that helps to provide scientific um, support for some of the solutions you've put forward? Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you very much, and I'm sorry for the delay. Uh, many thanks for uh, agreeing to, to take part as speakers, and many thanks for the audience. Uh, indeed, uh, I come from the Joint Research Center, which is part of the European Commission, and what we do, uh, we generate, uh, we claim a, a world-class knowledge, and also we manage uh, the available collective wisdom and knowledge in order to make it uh, available to our policymakers. So that is our mission, and I really wanted to, to share that with you. As such, actually, we, we work in many areas, and uh, many of these areas touch upon uh, how we can actually address or redress territorial inequalities. And I will mention some of them, and they, uh, you, you asked about the global perspective. Mm -hmm. All these that I'm going to mention, they don't have only European perspective, but they can be really open globally to everything that happens uh, in the world. So I will uh, start with um, a knowledge center, and you can always go and see on our website, Knowledge Center on Territorial Policies, where you can find a lot of analysis, a lot of data that show what is the impact on the various territories uh, as a result of either policy action mm -hmm or any other shock, we say, any other shock uh, uh, initiative that might come uh, to play. On, on the other hand, uh, we, I'm just coming from Bucharest, where we presented our um, report on the future of cities. And this is not only European perspective, but it is also global perspective. And this is one way of how we can treat territories at the level of granularity where things happen 
and where the nice and innovation-based solutions can be designed. So in a way, uh, I would really advise you go to the site. It's brand new. It's just a couple of days ago that it was launched. And many of the chapters where we examine uh, various aspects of urban development, you can see that they touch upon territorial inequalities. And I can immediately give you an example. Um, one of the chapters is about affordable housing. And uh, actually, you can see that, of course, there, there is a lot of data, a lot of uh, analysis. It is also online, by the way, and you can dig into data and use it for your own purposes. Uh, there are uh, such variations uh, in, uh, in how uh, various populations within even one neighborhood, uh, for example, uh, in, in, uh, in the case of, um, uh, uh, of uh, Sevilla, uh, only two kilometers distance gives a big uh, um, uh, difference in ratio of how much one will pay for housing. Mm. And it reaches up to 40% of your income and goes much down uh, to a richer quarter. So we are talking about territorial differences and inequalities that are two kilometers away. So what we do at the Joint Research Center we gather the data, we analyze it, and we actually inform the policies in order to take the right decisions and to, to really apply the policy solutions that will address in an informed way all these inequalities. So this is just one example and uh, uh, actually touches, as we see, not only uh, poor countries or developing countries, it touches countries that are uh, well-developed, and cities that we know that are well-developed. Uh, just take mobility, and um, if we take it even in a wider perspective of connectivity, it, is, it showed. Mm -hmm. I felt uh, not equally treated today because I then didn't have the accessibility, the mobility uh, uh, that will really ensure my, my presence here. So uh, one of the... And real beauties of the new technologies is that they can serve, they can enable solutions, and this is what we do. Yeah. Uh, they can ensure solutions that can provide uh, accessibility connectivity. So we are really spread very wide. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of experience in the area of innovation policies, and also we have a technology watch, or uh, we call it innovation and technology a monitor, that can um, first of all, see the emerging technologies, and then we assess the possible impacts of these technologies, including on territorial equality. So we have quite an experience in innovation policies, and probably later on I can talk about one of our tools that is now uh, popular even UN-wide, mm -hmm. uh, the Smart Specialization, which helps the territories to develop their potential so that they, they equalize uh, their... Um, uh, accessibility, their, equal, their opportunities, um, and uh, uh, they serve the cohesion policy in Europe, but it also serves to develop territorial potential elsewhere. So, No, thank you for that. And I'm sure, I mean, just hearing um, recently about well, what the panelists have shared already about transparency, I think the idea now that policymakers are looking at the research that you all are providing to really analyze that the solutions that they're creating are based on what the people actually want and need in those, those cities and communities around the world. So thank you for that. And we will come back to you a little bit later. But I now want to turn to um, Latrice, because I know one of the problems with, with forums like this is that oftentimes we ask young people to speak on behalf of all young people. You know, it's, it's a very small job to speak on behalf of 1.8 billion. Um, but I'm sure you're up for, um, up for the job. But really what I would like for you to do is to actually talk about yourself, right? To talk about how your personal professional experience thus far has really led to the work that you do around inequalities in communities that you, um, that you work and advocate on behalf of. Thank you. I was born and raised in the 11th most violent city in the world. In my experience in this city and in many other Brazilian cities, was always marked by fear. Fear of using public transportation. Fear to go to school. Fear of walking the streets. Fear of the city itself. And the story that I'm telling you today is not only mine. 
but that of millions of other Brazilian women. Yesterday, the, the um, Patricia Galvão Institute revealed that 97% of Brazilian women suffered sexual harassment in public spaces. 97. And we cannot say that we are building real sustainable cities when women are facing sexual harassment in transportation systems, in buses, and metro systems. We cannot say there is a sustainable city when a mother can't walk with her child because pathways are too dark and too dangerous. And definitely, we cannot talk about sustainability when something as basic as accessibility has not been addressed. To give you an example of this issue, one of the research that I cared in Belo Horizonte, the city where I live, showed that six out of ten men would use bikes instead of cars if the city provided the correct infrastructure, like bike paths and a place to keep the bike. Can you guess how many women would make the same choice if the same infrastructure was provided? Less than 10%. And the reasons are disturbing. First, women, especially the young ones, feel more vulnerable to violence in public spaces than men. Second, women's movements are not structured around homework binary journeys, mm -hmm. but around travel loops involving all the domestic tasks traditionally assigned to them, like shopping and accompanying their children and accompanying their parents. However, when we, engineers, urban planners, and policymakers, are planning our cities, we do not take this gender perspective account. This was the center issue discussed last year at the World Urban Forum, where I was presenting. In planning terms, it's necessary to analyze microphysics of territories as a key for gender safety. And the fact of not seeing such difference only perpetuates inequalities. We now know that cities, at, in their essence, give at the same time to both challenges and opportunities. And achieving the SDG 11 makes cities sustainable, resilient, and safe set the stage to achieve many other SDGs. For instance, clean water, sanitation, and clean energy. However, women are being left behind in many scenarios, and it reflects directly at our city's economy, at our territories, at our families. When we hold women back, we are holding our cities back too. Thank you for that. Um, no, and I think so much of what you said resonated with me, and I want everyone to give you a round of applause for sharing your personal story. Um, because I think it helps to really lay the foundation for, for why including community members, a diverse set of community members, a part of the conversation as we're developing solutions is so needed. Because it's no coincidence that when we look at education around the world, women are oftentimes left out. And so they're not in industries like city planning and engineering and like or in policy making positions. And so of course, a lot of the innovations that's happening isn't reflective of those experiences. And so I thank you for, help, for helping to raise that um, to the audience um, perspective. I, I, as someone who lives in Brazil, what are some of the solutions that you're now seeing? Or are there solutions that are now happening that are including the voices of women in, the, in policy making decisions around urban planning? Yes, um, Belo Horizonte okay. uh, and the transition to the SDG agenda is part of the municipal strategic action. In order to subsidize public policies, the city established 144 local indicators to be monitored till 2030. And this is impressive compared to other Latin American cities. Belo Horizonte 
also created the SDG thematic budget, linking the entire city budget to at least one SDG. Regarding gender equality, Belo Horizonte signed in 2017 the UN platform City 5050, all for equality, ensuring the woman's participation in the municipal executive officer. In addition, something new is that they created a municipal gender committee, a group responsible, composed by representatives of all secretariats, education, health, culture, housing. And they are responsible to unify all the public policies of the city that already exist, mm -hmm. integrate them, and identify the gaps to be closed in order to achieve gender equity. The goal is to produce the first municipal gender plan of Brazil and to be finalized this year. However, we know that it's not possible to propose solutions to problems for which we do not understand. And the public sector so far does not have the history of public space perception mm. where women do not feel safe. What are their causes? How public lightning, maintenance, open store at night, and the presence of people influences women's perception of safety. The lack of data and research on public spaces prevents affirmative actions to combat such inequalities. So through the local pathways fellowship, a program created by the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, I develop a project that aims to empower women in their neighborhoods, hearing their complaints, collecting the data needed, understanding the reasons and also the possible solutions for this problem. And what we want is that these voices be heard, to be heard by the public sector. And the public policies that Belo Horizonte is creating should and will take gender perspective as a basis for creating public spaces. And as you can see, this conversation goes beyond only public lightning and accessible sidewalks. Public spaces are a reflection of our own society, of the power and infrastructure of our cities. If women are not, are excluded from power, our cities will exclude them. That's why that more important than having gender sensitive leaders, we, have to, we need to have women leaders. Women making decisions in planning our cities. Society, however, does not always accept that. And when this status quo is finally broken, there could be violent consequences. Once a woman, a black woman, a black woman coming from the slums, urban slums, came into power. And then she was murdered. That was what happened last year yeah. with Marielle Franco, a city councilwoman from Rio de Janeiro. Marielle Franco's legislative proposals sought to secure and support women's rights. The LGBT community, black people, and Islam's communities. People in power didn't want such communities to receive the correct infrastructure, the necessary security. These communities should have the right to a city. The right to the city is an important debate. But now, the next step is to decide who will plan our cities. Thank you. Thank you. And wow, so first of all,
Um, thank you for bringing Maria into this space, because I think oftentimes we think, we think about who we're creating solutions for, we think about those who are of the living, right? But also as those who unfortunately have perished because of their inability to get access to real resources, real opportunities, or even when they get access to power, to feel safe and able to, and that will enable them to share their story um, without them being fear of violence. So I really appreciate you sharing that because public spaces cannot be considered public spaces if not everyone is equally able to participate in that. Um, I now want to open the floor up to see if there are any questions. Don't be shy. Yes, we have one question over here. We're going to have microphones coming to each side of the room. So if you could just stand up. And when you ask your question, if you could just say your name and where you're from, um, that would be great. Thank you so much. I'm called Kiza Hussein from Uganda. I work uh, to represent Africa at the Africa Youth Organization as the Africa Lead. I'm so uh, really touched with the discussions you're having here because they directly resonate with the lives of the people that uh, I always interact with in our communities. Uh, my question goes to, first, there are two, one for youth, and now another one is it's open to anyone who can answer. So for the youth, uh, we well uh, know that youth no longer want to stay in the villages because if you go back to Africa, also in some of the countries, you find that cities are compacted of many young people who feel the opportunities can only be uh, obtained in cities, not in the villages. So there is total inequality in terms of how government allocates services and resources. So how do you answer that to the maybe institutions which are represented there, the government which are represented here? How should they allocate resources so that cities have equitable uh, access to these resources and they can keep their use in those, can in those areas? Then the other open one, the open question that anyone can answer, is in regards to women. Uh, I've, I've just been interacting with a, a, a victim, a woman who is a victim of mine, landslide, mine, mine, slide, uh, is it mine slide, something like that. She w used to work in mines, and the mine collapsed, and she lost her leg on duty. <coughs> and she was uh, speaking for, on behalf of the many young are many rather women and even men who have become a victim of, of, of mine slides and all that. So in relation to the inequalities of the cities, women in villages don't have access to services, to like hospitals where they can go and get these treatments, which are equally very expensive. But those who are living in more developed maybe countries or in the cities have access to these services. So how do you also... Uh, maybe speak to the world, how should these people who are suffering because of poor budgeting and allocation of resources in, in, in relation to geographical uh, identifications, how should they handle this? Thank you. Thank you for that. Do you want to take the question first about you? Yes. Um, to answer the question, I'll speak in French. Mm -hmm. Just, you know. um, we, uh, les villes, yes. ont, les pou ont, ont cet pouvoir the cities do have this power to bring young people together who actually want better opportunities when it comes to education and to jobs. But one point I wanted to underscore is that cities shouldn't just be seen as the only place where education is important and employment. The same goes for rural areas. And not all opportunities should be centered in cities. You don't want to continue to have people moving from the countryside to the cities because there are no opportunities there. You need balance. And moving on. On the question about having uh, secure areas, and the changes that are necessary and uh, being more flexible. The education system in cities uses the same systems for planning and thinking that it's been using for years. And yet our world has changed totally with the introduction of new forms of technology, 
but also the way in which people interact now and the fact that they now change jobs regularly as new needs emerge. So keeping the same power structures, the same governance structures is not tenable when the young people are demanding more involvement and more changes because they're suffering every day the consequences of the fact that their cities don't provide equal opportunities. And so really, I would say the only thing keeping people going sometimes is hope. So I think really that's the important point. Being more flexible and harnessing the optimism and desire to be involved of young people to change what's happening in public life. Thank you for that. Does anyone else, I figure you might want to touch on the cities, please. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, actually, you might think that it's not a problem for Europe, but it's very much a problem for Europe that there is a difference in uh, uh, access and opportunities between the rural and the urban areas. And what we do actually, first of all, we have to understand what is going on. Uh, so that's why this territorial policies approach covering with indicators um, uh, from environment to social, from uh, economic development to climate, it really gives us an idea what the situation is and where the fixes should happen. So we also have behavioral studies, which also brings a lot of insight. This is one of our new trends of what we do. Uh, actually, one of the remedies, one of the good solutions is when you bring urban and rural areas in functional partnership. Mm -hmm. Of course, that is a very good um, way of doing things when we have proximity. Because the way cities are dependent on rural areas, for example, for food, for, uh, sometimes for water, or even for green areas, the same way rural areas are dependent for more services, cultural life, and so on. So if we consider functional areas, and if we have these partnerships, between urban and adjacent rural areas, and um, uh, the governance of both types of areas bring them themselves together and really have targeted measures uh, highlighting the benefits of the two types of um, services that they can provide, then it can be really beneficial and very synergetic. What we do also, we have a very targeted policy because I totally agree, it is important to create for any territory, good uh, standard of life, access to services, and so on. But probably the best way to do that is by enabling the communities to develop. So that's why we have uh, approaches, we call them bottom-up approaches, they're quite um, uh, popular. And the bottom-up approach of creating strategies, discovering the potential of the area, and uh, building societal agreement and consensus of what to be done, and then, of course, financing targeted measures in order to fulfill the, the, the long-term targets, probably that is the way. But um, we need a targeted approach. And for that, we need informed policies and good data. Exactly. Yes. Yes, um, no, thank you. And uh, actually, I think that the, the key question is the relation between uh, what is happening in terms of urban growth, and as you said, I mean, uh, secondary cities and relation between secondary cities and rural area are key in this system. And what is the governance system that you put in place in front of that? Because so far, those governance systems, I, I mean, at least for the least developed countries in which we are working in, uh, it's more like of ad hoc governance system, but nothing is really legitimate in front of people. So, I mean, representation of women, youth, uh, old people too. I mean, a way to have a kind of more fair distribution of role uh, in the cities is, uh, is a key issue and helping those institutions to access to finance and be able to act. So one thing is to think what is your problem and how to solve it, but another one is being able to act in a way that you have a budget to do that and to be uh, uh, redevability, yes, redevable for people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me just quickly add uh, one uh, set of issues that is important, and I really uh, hear you about services, education, health services. Um, 
there are some work that we've done and people we've talked to here in Europe even. Um, in Europe, many economies are doing quite well, right? Even in the rural areas, partly because of European policies. So there are sometimes opportunities, job opportunities, even in secondary cities and rural areas. And for example, I talked about Romania. You just came, came from there in Romania. Um, I spoke to uh, people who work on the very thriving tech sector uh, in Romania, in a city that's on the Moldovan border called Yash. And in Yash, they say, because there is actually a thriving tech sector, the companies, which are multinational companies, have no problem attracting bright young people to work there. Okay, they come from the universities, the multinationals train them, and they get, very importantly, levels of salary that adjusted for the cost of living, which is quite low, are equivalent to German salaries. So there are actually in an inflow of young people into jobs in Yash that is quite high, and they don't go to Germany, then they don't go to richer countries because, of course, you'd like to live at home. The really important story which really resonates with what you said, you know, and I asked them, so these people stay? I said, no, they don't stay. So when do they leave? They leave when they have children. Because then the problem comes that the schools in Yash mm -hmm. are not as good as the schools in Germany. Right? So in some ways, when you're talking about people leaving, it is not just about jobs. Of course, that's a huge part of that but it is about the basic quality of services and life that you get. And so there are actually ways to look at this very, very uh, explicitly. Um, as all of you know, it's not just that the government should just give more money to the uh, rural areas. It is because even if you give money, will the teachers, the best teachers in the country, move there? Yeah. Will the best doctors move there to set up practices? And the answer usually is no. So there needs to be not just money, but additional incentives, including by the local governments, mm -hmm. to try and make sure that doctors and, and teachers also want to live in these areas, in the poorer areas, to provide additional incentives. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of work to be done in behavioral economics or psychology, psychological uh, uh, policy making that actually show how you want to attract uh, these people to these areas. So yes, there is a lot of attention needs to be paid, but the solutions are not just trivial like give more money. Thank you for that. Unfortunately, we don't have time to take more questions. Um, unfortunately, we're running out of time. But to continue the conversation, again, I want to encourage each and every one of you to use the hashtag, hashtag E. DD19 and then hashtag think twice to continue the conversation and also to share information that you learn from this session. I now would like to turn it back over to Ms. Vikjova, who is the deputy director for the Joint Research Center, um, who is also the sponsor for this event, to give us some closing remarks. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, uh, I, I really want to reassure you, it's not only because we organize uh, this session, but we have a real commitment to treating uh, territorial inequalities. We have a lot of work done. If you go to our site, you will see we have a couple of fairness reports. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the chapters, as I said, of the city's report deal with uh, territorial inequalities. We uh, do a lot on inno innovative solutions, and I really wanted to make a remark to what you said, which is very true about accessibility to services. There are wonderful innovative solutions of how we can bridge the gap of distance nowadays. Uh, we know about the platformization of uh, uh, business models. Uh, we know about um, a distant way of providing services, probably not in education as well, probably not best teachers and so on, but there are some alternative ways. So we are trying to, ma to really marry innovative solutions, how to treat various types of territorial inequalities. So I think that probably I have to also say something on behalf of the European Commission. Uh, I don't know to what extent um, uh, the audience uh, know about our latest communication with regard to sustainable development goals, which is actually towards a sustainable Europe but in 2030. So our, um, uh, one of the speakers was uh, talking about 
providing a policy framework which will uh, uh, actually measure the impact of any policy initiatives against the development goals, the 17 goals, even the targets and indicators. So this is what we are trying to do in, uh, in the Commission. And we have a piece of work in the Joint Research Center that is trying to put together all the modeling capacity that we have in order to measure the impact of our policy measures in the Commission against each and every um, uh, sustainable development goals. So we are very serious in the Commission. Uh, we have organized also a lot of platforms where we invite the stakeholders uh, and really people to speak up and give ideas of how we can manage uh, policies that will be territorially non-blind but open and informed and how we can be in, uh, truly sustainable. I will mention, uh, mention some of these platforms and I will mention the platform of smart specialization which is not a truly European only but it is also truly global because we have a lot of um, uh, uh, countries from uh, Latin America that are interested in this very interesting concept of how to enable territories to pick up and bridge the gap of economic development versus everybody else. So just go there. I'm uh, available for any questions you might have outside. I will stay for 15 minutes now at least. And uh, thank you very much for your interest. Yeah. We are with you and we go ahead with our work in, to the benefit of the European and uh, world citizens. Exactly, and I think it's really important that all of you know, that which has been mentioned by the entire panelists, is that the work is not easy, and, but it's gonna require the solutions and collaborations between researchers, service providers, young people, policymakers, to really help us to move closer to the solutions needed to actually ensure that we're not just creating innovation for innovation's sake, if it's also not including the lived experiences of those most marginalized within our community communities, our cities, and our rural areas. I would like to thank this amazing panelist for joining me today. So if you can join me in giving them a round of applause. I'm sure some of them will stay after to answer any questions, but thank you all for taking the time to join this conversation and continue to ask questions and continue the conversation online. So thank you.